Hello and welcome to APM Research, the 144,000, the Creator's Glory. First, I would like to apologise to the rest of the team and you, the people, for the delays in releasing this video. Real life situations are giving me less computer time, but it has also given me time to reflect, which we will get into later. If you have been following our research, you will see how we have decoded the Creator's glory to be technology in the underworld and at the scripturally mentioned gates in the north, south, east and west. This technology has made its configuration very obvious with the sun and moon halos and within holy books and many other avenues when decoded correctly. These are the scripturally mentioned angels, Anunnaki, Cherubim, Seraphim, Elohim and many other names depending on the culture describing it. What you were all describing is the same Creator's glory. What we have decoded and revealed is going to shock you to the core. There is nothing in this world that can prepare you for what our research is revealing and there is nothing you learned at school that can even begin to explain it. That being said, we have grown up being accustomed to technology and with our guidance, research and decodings and the science of Walter Russell, we can explain and piece this together for you to understand what Walter's work actually relates to. The Creator's glory. The angel technologies of the underworld that we have been decoding for some time now. Our research and decodings will guide you to the connections and true meanings of a great many subjects that all relate to the same conclusions. This is a technological construct which reveals a very intelligent creator. We apologise in advance for what you will experience as you absorb our research and decodings, as we know this is going to be a very painful process for some of you to come to terms with and comprehend. But do not despair, for the creator and creation are indeed very real as our research is proving. This information and knowledge is yours. It is everyone's. The Creator wanted you to know all of this. It was passed on from our ancestors in many ways so we never forget. Because there is an event that happens every 400 years. This event is a reset event, a change in our world's mechanisms. Now mainstream are going to call this event a pole shift event. We call it the dark ages in our history because this event can cause memory loss, genetic change and of course the destruction we see recorded in history and also what holy books and prophecies describe. Unscrupulous people can take advantage of these events and that is what we are seeing in history. What we decoded from the Book of Miracles helped us to decode this reset and some of the changes the world will see. This includes seeing the Sun Halo, this is the angel technology revealing itself. Our end times, revelations and prophecy decoded videos will help you see and understand some of these events. From what we see, the Creator's glory has never adequately been explained until now. And it is this glory we have been revealing over the past four years. This glory, when decoded correctly, matches the technology and working descriptions of the technology man is calling a particle accelerator. What we are revealing is that they were already here. There are 144,000 to locate and we are going to help you locate them all. Our research also shows you the science and knowledge the ancients used as they understood the workings of this world very well. So from here on in, when I use the name Angel, just remember I refer to the technology man calls a particle accelerator. To the tribes of the world, please take this information to your tribal leaders and they will know I speak the sacred knowledge of the unspoken things. They will remember this and they will know the signs. Show them this video, it is so very important, because religion, spirituality, tribal dances, glyphs, sacred geometry, prophecies, jewellery, songs, mandalas, which are your blueprints to your world, 
even your flags and a great many other things are there to remind you what this world is and how it works. You will see many of these aforementioned topics come to life in our research and decodings as we explore our true world and put everything back into its original context so you can understand what it all really relates to. 400 year reset. If you haven't seen our other videos on this subject, they are in our playlist. Here's Amanda. Hello everyone, my name is Amanda, otherwise known as Boris Chops. I've been following APM research for two years now with keen interest. To me, it's by far the closest research to reality that I've come across in regards to world mechanics and decodings of the clues the ancients left us in their art and writings. Today, we are going to take a deeper look into DNA and the effects the environment can have on it in the present and in the past, including some of the errors that can occur. From the moment fertilisation occurs, the cells begin to divide, creating new cells from existing ones. The cells of the embryo divide rapidly, and so the embryo is quickly to become a foetus, a tiny human complete with internal organs and body system comprising tissues made up of specialist cell types. It's the genetic code that controls these early developmental processes. After birth, there is another period of rapid growth, new cells constantly forming by repeated cell division. DNA is primarily located within the nucleus of each cell, where it is contained in structures known as chromosomes. Each plant and animal and human cell has a copy of the organism's genetic material. This DNA carries a complete blueprint of the characteristics from one generation to the next. The differences between plants, animals and humans are pretty obvious, but at the chemical level, the core cells have DNA in the same shape as the double helix and are made from the same four chemical building blocks called nucleotides. What could possibly go wrong? Conjoined twins Lazarus and Johannes Baptista were born in 1617 in Genoa, Italy and lived their life touring the freak shows in 17th century Europe. Johannes was growing out of Lazarus' chest and could not speak or hardly move, but just made slight noises. Lazarus was known to be courteous and handsome. He married and fathered two children, none of which inherited his condition. Josephine Corbin was born on the 12th of May 1868 to normal parents although physicians noted the parents looked more like kin. Her disorder gave her two separate pelvises side by side from the waist down as a result of her body access splitting as it developed. Only her outer legs were strong enough to walk as the centre pair were too weak. Josephine worked as a performer in the sideshows and had five children with her husband James. Ella Harper, known as the Camel Girl, was born on the 5th of January 1870 with a rare condition that caused her knees to bend backwards. This disorder is called congenital genu recurvatum. Her preference to walk on all fours was what resulted in her nickname. She made good money performing but gave it up to pursue other interests and later married and bore one daughter called Mabel. Bill Dirks, a.k.a. the man with three eyes, was born in April of 1913 to completely normal parents. 
Bill suffered from a disorder called frontonasal dysplasia, which gave him a deep cleft going down the middle of his face, resulting in the illusion of having two faces. Although pictured here as having a third eye, Bill actively used to paint on an eye in the cavity as part of his stage act. Bill married a fellow performer called Mildred, aka the alligator skinned woman. It should be noted that none of the offspring born to these interesting people inherited the disorders that their parents bore. Well, nothing in life is perfect, so let's take a look at what can cause defects and mutations in this very fragile system. DNA polymerase enzymes are amazingly particular with respect to their choice of nucleotides during DNA synthesis, ensuring that the bases added to a growing strand are correctly paired with their complements on the template strand. Nonetheless, these enzymes do make mistakes at a rate of one per every 100,000 nucleotides. Incorrectly paired nucleotides that still remain following mismatch self-repair become permanent mutations after the next cell division. This is because once such mistakes are established, the cell no longer recognises them as errors. When these mistakes are not corrected, the incorrectly sequenced DNA strand serves as a template for future replication events, causing all the base pairings thereafter to be wrong. Although most mutations are believed to be caused by replication errors, they can also be caused by various environmentally induced and spontaneous changes to DNA, like weather, diet, chemicals, radiation and even negative thoughts. These causes are known as mutagens, and in modern times we are surrounded by influences that permanently mutate our genes. But looking back through history, what could be causing the mutations documented in old writings and art? As covered in the End Time series of videos, we can see evidence of this happening long before radio, Wi-Fi and television transmissions were invented. Even a simple little plant like the clover can be infected by environment alone. This plant, for the most part, produces three leaves, with the odd exception of four. However, a particularly hot summer can alter the DNA, so it keeps producing more four-leaved versions of itself. I myself found my first four-leaf clover in the midst of a heat wave when I was 44. With environmental factors in mind, let's take a look at an interesting discovery made by Jon Athorsson, an Icelandic meteorologist in 1951. He found what appeared to be, at first glance, a herd of small furry creatures moving very slowly around in a uniform manner, but on closer inspection realised that they were actually squishy pillows of moss that were not attached by any roots. He named his find glacier mice, which they are still known as today. In more recent years, these glacier mice have been tracked and monitored to try and find out exactly what they're up to. Over a period of two months, a selection of around 30 of the herd were tagged and monitored, and it became apparent that their movements were not just random, but rather a group effort following a certain predictable pattern. Unlike tumbleweeds that are just blowing around in the wind, these mossy little critters are rolling together at the same rate of 2.5 centimetres per day. Upon revisiting the glacier mice over the year, they could all be seen to travel slowly to the south, then start to speed up and deviate to the west before slowing down again towards west. We have looked at nature's patterns of motion previously in APM research and see it with many animal and plant species. Glacier mice will not just grow anywhere, their environment has to be just right. They can be found in Iceland, Alaska, Chile, Svalbard and Venezuela and can live between five and six years. Mainstream science still cannot fully explain this natural phenomenon away with just solar radiation and temperature reactions alone. In this era of high tech that we find ourselves, is it any wonder that there is an increase in genetic disorders and so many different types of cancer? It has long been foretold that this is not the way we should be living for the good of humanity, the animals and the earth. 
In 1958, on a hot summer's day, a minister named David Young stopped to offer a ride to an Indian elder, who accepted with a nod. After riding for several minutes, the Indian said, I am White Feather, a hoppy of the ancient Bear Clan. In my long life, I have travelled through this land, seeking my brothers and learning from them many things of wisdom. I have followed all the sacred paths of my people who inhabit the forests and many lakes in the east, the land of ice and the long nights in the north, and the places of the holy altars built many years ago by my brother's fathers in the south. From all these I have heard stories of the past and the prophecies of the future. Today many of the prophecies have turned to stories, and a few are left. The past grows longer and the future grows shorter. This is the first sign. We are told of the coming of the white skinned men, like Bahana but not living like Bahana men, who took the land that was not theirs, and men who struck their enemies with thunder. The second sign. Our lands will see the coming of spinning wheels filled with voices. In his youth, my father saw this prophecy come true with his own eyes, which was the white man bringing their families in wagons across the prairies. The third sign. A strange beast like buffalo, but with long horns, will overrun the land in large numbers. These white feathers saw, with his own eyes, which was the coming of the white men's cattle. The fourth sign. The land shall be crossed with snakes of iron. The fifth sign. The land shall be crisscrossed by a giant spider's web. The sixth sign. The land shall be crisscrossed with rivers of stone that make pictures in the sun. The seventh sign. You will hear of the sea turning black and many living things dying because of it. The eighth sign. You will see many youth who wear their hair long, like my people, come and join the tribal nations to learn their ways and wisdom. And this is the ninth sign. You will hear of a dwelling place in the heavens above the earth that shall fall with a great crash. It will appear as a blue star. Very soon after this, the ceremonies of my people will cease. Many of my people understanding the prophecies shall be safe. There will be much to rebuild and soon, very soon, afterwards Pahana will return. He shall bring with him the dawn of the fifth world. But White Feather shall not see it. I am old and dying. Perhaps you will see it in time. The old ill Indian fell silent. They had arrived at his destination and Reverend Young stopped to let him out of his car. The Reverend died in 1976, so did not live to see the further fulfillment of this remarkable prophecy. The signs interpreted as follows. The first sign is of guns. The second, is of the pioneers covered wagons. The third sign is the longhorn cattle. The fourth sign describes the railroad tracks. The fifth sign is a clear image of our electric power and foam wires. The sixth sign describes concrete highways and their mirage producing effects. The seventh sign foretells of oil spills in the oceans. The eighth sign clearly indicates the hippie movement of the 60s. The ninth sign was the US Skylab that fell to the ground in 1979, which according to an Australian eyewitness, appeared to be a burning blue light. The Hopi also predicted that when the heart of the Hopi Land Trust is dug up, great disturbances will develop in the balance of nature, for the Hopi Land is a microcosmic image of the entire world. Any violations of nature in the Four Corners regions will be reflected and amplified all over the earth. The Hopi Indians are the keepers of the Native Americans. 
They call this age the fourth age of man, and according to them, the earth has been wiped clean three times already. First by fire, second by ice, and most recently by flood, approximately 11,000 to 12,000 years ago. They also state we are about to enter the fifth age, which they called the world of illumination, which seems to coincide with the dawning of the age of Aquarius. Hobbies say we need to return to the earth, and one way to do that is to restore our bodies to health by eating natural grain, wheat, rice, and corn. We need to stop fighting each other, as the people are not the enemy, the corporations are the enemy, as they are greedy and take profits now without regard to the future or environment. The Hopi are fully aware of the earth cycles and effects on living beings and plant life. They try to live and encourage others to live within nature rather than against it, to ensure our survival through an end times event, which they see as a new beginning. We are creating now what our tomorrow shall be. A few wise words and accurate predictions there from the Hopi people, who share their knowledge to try and help us all and Mother Earth, although ultimately we are at the mercy of Earth's cycles. In the 1800s, a very important discovery was made by Gregor Johann Mendel, a friar from the Augustinian Abbey of St Thomas in the Czech Republic, but was not realised until after his death. There, he grew and studied the common pea plant, Pisum sativum, and crossbred many different plant combinations, observing and recording several different characteristics of plants. He noted seeds, colour, shape, stem length, position of flowers on the stem, and the colour of the pods. He did this with such intricate detail across several generations that he was able to determine that the transmitted traits he observed resembled either one plant or the other, and not an amalgamation of the two, as scientists before him had assumed. Over a period of eight years, he conducted experiments on his pea plants to determine how this happens. He published his findings in 1865, when he concluded that there were three laws that determined how traits are inherited. The law of dominance, the law of segregation, and the law of independent assortment. This type of biological inheritance is still known as Mendelian inheritance and has been added to over the years by subsequent scientists. Mendel's work lives on today in our understanding of the different patterns of inheritance. We now know that the unit of hereditary that he observed to convey a trait from the generation to the next is in fact a gene. Today, geneticists construct pedigrees and look for clues that might reveal how a particular trait or disease is being transmitted, either autumnal or sex-linked and dominant or recessive. These studies are still going on, so there is still much to learn, as we know from the reported 2% DNA they label as junk DNA. Surely it has a purpose. In genetics, we see the study of hereditary traits transmitted through the DNA from one generation to the next. However, what matters in epigenetics are the chemical tags interspersed throughout the genetic code that can impact upon the way the genes work. In other words, epigenetics is the study of the chemical modification to the DNA and the effects they have on the genome. Unlike DNA itself, a small number of these tags are passed on to the next generation, but mostly the epigenetic slate is wiped clean or so it is thought. The importance of epigenetics in our health and well-being is becoming clearer every year that goes by. During the Dutch famine of 1944 to 1945, 20,000 people were reported to have died of starvation. A number of women were pregnant during this time and research followed these women and babies in order to understand the consequences of adverse nutrition in mothers and babies' long-term health. The results showed that the children in the Dutch Hunger Winter Cohort Study grew up to have higher levels of cholesterol in their blood, a risk factor of heart disease, and stroke in a higher incidence of obesity, diabetes and mental health problems such as schizophrenia. They were followed well into their 60s and it seems the individuals had a higher rate of mortality compared with others their age 
whose mothers were not victims of a famine. Pictured here is Audrey Hepburn, the actress, and her mother, Baroness Ella Van Hemstra. Ella was Dutch and the family were caught up in the 1944 to 1945 famine. Audrey had lifelong negative repercussions, suffering from anemia, respiratory illness and fluid retention as an adult. Researchers studied their DNA profiles and found a different pattern in them, raising the possibility that epigenetic memory somehow mediated the link between poor nutrition in the womb and later adverse effects upon health. Exactly how this happens is still a mystery. Scientists hope that epigenetics will give the answers to questions such as how does environmental exposure to certain factors alter the fundamental workings of the DNA and what happens to these processes in the course of a human life. It is well known that identical twins are not fundamentally alike, yet they have the same genetic code. So what accounts for the differences? It has long been thought that twins' environment, exposures to certain factors such as environment, sleep, illness and trauma are disparate between twins. So in the context of nature versus nurture, epigenetics is emerging as a main driver behind the effect of environmental exposure on our health. It plays an important role early in life during embryolic development and is a key factor in organ development. Lovely presentation and updates on the 400 year reset Amanda. What Amanda is showing you are the cyclic events of this reset humanity has to face every 400 years. There are several afflictions humanity undergoes in this realm and this is just one of them. DNA change due to a reset event of which we will go deeper into later. The map and grid you see on screen are the map and model we work with. We have come to find the international date lines are fake, hiding where the luminaries come from and go to, and anything else beyond. They are a mental block, the edge of the globe. The Arctic and Antarctic restrictions are not the only locations hiding more secrets. No shipping or aircraft cross the international date lines. The data is being flipped to appear to be. They are really using routes in the north over Greenland to cross the map, and the same must be happening in the south. GPS your flight and compare it to the flipped data recordings found on Flight Radar 24. World War II was all about taking control of the perimeters, and it has never stopped. In 1947, a US fleet sailed to Antarctica in search of Nazi war criminals. A year later, the US built the world's first nuclear power station. Admiral Byrd mentioned land south of the South Pole. He was not speaking of the globe. On Antarctica, here's one conscience. Mainstream Science News High energy particles discovered in Antarctica. Scientists are baffled. Hmm. What do they actually do to earn their paychecks? They spend most of their time baffled. Always baffled because they are so compartmentalized, they cannot understand the full picture. They are stuck decoding data and attempting to use a globe model. They will continue to be baffled, which is sad because they can't see the full picture under this guise. They will always have more questions than answers, and that's too bad considering how much they probably paid for their degree. So, our baffled scientists have been studying a fountain of high energy particles using NASA instruments in Antarctica, and may have discovered evidence of what they are calling proof of a universe parallel to our own. Well, I'm disagreeing with that. However, let's continue to see what they're talking about. The baffling discovery of cosmic ray-like particles streaming from the ice was first dismissed by scientists as background noise. This was detected in 2014 and 2016 by NASA's Antarctic Impulsive 
transia antenna, also known as Anita. The Anita experiment has been designed to study ultra-high energy cosmic neutrinos detecting the radio pulses emitted by their interactions with the Antarctic ice sheet. This is to be accomplished by using an array of radio antennas suspended from a helium balloon flying at a height of about 37,000 meters, which is about 122,000 feet in the air. The neutrinos, which are subatomic particles with a mass close to zero, produce radio pulses in the ice because of the Icarian effect. This effect is also known as Icarian radiation and is the phenomenon where a particle is traveling faster than the phase velocity of light in a dense dielectric such as salt or ice. The Sicarian effect produces a shower of secondary charged particles which contain a charade anisotropy and thus emits a cone of coherent radiation in the radio or microwave part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So what is really going on here is the neutrinos are neutral particles and when it enters the angel below it then becomes a positive or negative which is the secondary charged particle they are talking about. They will then come up from the ground into the cones which is where Anita is then collecting the data and recording when each of these angels come online. We can see this in the corrected diagram I made. Also note that when the opposing force comes into the equation, we get what is called a bow shock. We will go more into detail about that here shortly. So of course scientists are baffled that the particles in Antarctica are streaming from the ground up, a feat normally considered impossible for high energy particles. They have stated they resemble an upside down cosmic ray shower and it looked just like a cosmic ray as seen a reflection off the ice sheet but wasn't being reflected. They said it was as if the cosmic ray had come out of the ground itself. As you can see in the animation, this is really the effect they are seeing. As we delve deeper into this information, we discover this observatory is buried a mile deep into the ice. Hmm, a cosmic ray observatory buried into the underworld should raise some flags with you all. I know it does for me. So they are saying they are observing some of the most distant and violent phenomenon in the cosmos such as colliding black holes, galaxies with super-violent cores, and mysterious gamma-ray bursts. All this is being observed from down in the Earth. Let that sink in for just a moment. Let's see what this observatory looks like. What it seems that's really going on here is they are digging down into one of our angel rooms. What they're talking about is the happenings in the underworld.
Here, they show us what they say is coming down from outer space. But when we switch it over to our map, it makes a lot more sense. We can see the below going to the above, connecting and coming back down. This is how the halos are created. So what they have been talking about are the cones that we have been working with from Walter Russell's work. The height of the halos and the cone angles, along with the power being generated, will each have a different effect. These are created by the angels, or what mainstream now calls particle accelerators, as we have stated before. This is science's feeble attempt to try to deceive us with outer space and alternate universe theories to fulfill their agenda. When you have APM eyes, it is easy to understand what scientists are talking about and be able to show the cause of the effects. We also see this mirroring in our stars. When I plotted these across the map, we realized that we see a perfect mirror in the heavens. We can see this in this example. Scientists say all this could have been created in the Big Bang. Well, this mirroring is true with all luminaries, and the Big Bang would be the turning on of this glory. Think on a grand scale of electricity, magnetism, and chemical reactions. The halo lattice is one way we can see this. In the atmosphere, it has been recorded of threefold rotational symmetrical crystal particles that are inconsistent of the known ice particles of hexagonal symmetry. What these are consistently seen in, though, are the periarch halos and show that they have a distinct radiative properties that differ from hexagonal ice crystals. Now remember, what is above is below. So if we see this all together, all turned on and all working at once, it would be similar to what you're seeing here. 
The as above, so below would still hold true, and the mirroring would still be the same. Below we have all the causes occurring, and above we see the effects. This is the Big Bang. I have been gazing into the vortex, probing it, decoding its secrets and sharing them with you. Since my very first video nearly five years ago, I have been decoding what the Milky Way is, how it works and interacts with our environment, what it is responsible for and what its effects are. I have revealed its presence in data, identified and modelled how it is involved in our seasons, explained what the spirals and glyphs represent, how I termed its functions as the spiralling pressure waves of electromagnetism, how its function is locked in between the tropics of Capricorn and Cancer, and a whole lot more. I have practically written the book on what the Milky Way is. Now this information is being heavily suppressed in this community. These people that aren't sharing it are holding you back and for all the wrong reasons. This information should be shared far and wide. It is world-changing information and very important. Our Milky Way is a spiraling vortex of alternating current. It programs the ether and the waters, and yes, I said programs. The electric dipoles that exist in air and water are constantly being programmed with positives and negatives of various potentials and colour. Different colours of the spectrum contain different electric potential. We live and breathe in a sea of alternating current, ladies and gentlemen. This was termed the ether or quintessence in ancient times. When I gazed into this spiralling vortex, I saw what Nikola Tesla and Walter Russell saw. I experienced their revelations and realisations. It is overwhelming, in more ways than I can describe. But I continue on and try to show in my research and explanations how we are revealing the Creator's glory, because this is what it is a part of. It is the primary driver in this realm. In 2D it looks like a sine wave, which in 3D is a spiral. It is our Milky Way, or Milky Wave as I call it. It has many names as you can see on screen and features in every culture's knowledge. In my first video, I added these sine waves. Later in our Heaven and Hell video, I decoded the Milky Way as a sine wave, and in our interview with Robin. I showed an animation of what the waveforms are doing. They also featured in our Angels Decoded video. This is Rahu and Ketu, the Yin Yang, and many other names. Now in 3D, what we are working with are spirals, and this is what they look like. What they are doing is rotating the ether across a horizontal plane. This mixes the positives and negatives which not only help create daylight but helps power our sun and other luminaries. It is also alternating current. During the day the moon takes second place. There are two spirals which help power our sun. The moon gives its light to the sun Enoch mentions. This means that the sun is king and takes priority which is why our moon isn't illuminated during the day. By night there is only one half of the waveform present, our Milky Way, which is what gives the moon its light. The second waveform has shut down to create what we call night, but will start again at the next sunrise, you can be assured. You may be surprised to find that you can have daylight without the sun. The sun is its own light, as is the moon. Both rely on these primary drivers spiralling forces that work together to create day and night. There are obviously other waveforms to decode, for each major luminary, as the speed they cross the plane with varies greatly. And I think this is related to different waveforms, different frequencies and different wavelengths. The shortwave luminaries seem to take longer to travel across. Here's Sandra with some lovely research. As most of you probably know, the dragon is represented in many forms throughout the world. And this is for a very special reason. A reason you must never forget. Here is some of your memory back from APM research, and this is what it represents. In what is perhaps one of the most popular traditions in Chinese culture, the dragon dance comes to life every Chinese New Year. 
The dragon dance is performed by a team, forming a long flexible figure of a dragon, with nine performers, each holding up a section of the dragon. We at APM Research believe these nine performers are representative of the nine octaves from Walter Russell's chart and also the Venturi of Walter Russell's motor. But most importantly, it represents the sine wave we decoded from the Milky Way. During the dance, the dragon will weave and undulate to the beat of a percussion band, just as our sine wave does. Sometimes the dance includes two dragons, a male and a female. We at APM Research believe these to represent the positive and negative sine waves. In the dragon dance, along with the nine performers holding the dragon, there is another performer ahead of the dragon holding a spherical object known as the pearl. From the oldest ancient depictions of the pearl, the dragon is chasing the sun. As time passed, artists depicted the sun as white rather than red. Legend then said that the dragon was seeking the night shining pearl, which resembles the white form of the full moon. As the dragon devours the pearl, less and less of the pearl is seen, and appears as a waning moon. As the dragon disgorges the pearl, more and more of the pearl is seen, and now it appears as a waxing moon, and this is thought to symbolise the endless cycle of transition. Today, several independent researchers connect both the enclosing serpent and primordial sun to the Axis Mundi, a column said to have once risen from the earth to the sky. This suggests that the cross-cultural theme of the glowing serpent and orb might have been inspired by intense plasma discharge in the atmosphere, perhaps comparable to the aurora, but much more powerful. Because the dragon is a special animal from the east, the pearl would suggest it represents the sun. But we know different, don't we, FPV? Let's take another look at the pearly gates. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce to you again the 12 pearly gates of heaven. The 12 gates in Revelation 21 belong to the New Jerusalem, which comes down from heaven to the new earth, verse 10. Shining with the glory of God, verse 11. John describes the city. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel, verse 12. The gates are miraculous in their construction. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of one single pearl, verse 21. And the gates of the New Jerusalem will never be never shut, verse 25. The pearl was esteemed of the greatest value among the ancients. It is an appropriate emblem of the highest truth. It is the only precious stone which the art and skill of man cannot improve. Introducing the three gates in the north, the gate of Reuben, the gate of Judah, and the gate of Levi. Introducing the three gates in the east, the gate of Joseph, the gate of Benjamin, and the gate of Dan. Introducing the three gates in the south, the gate of Simeon, the gate of Issachar, and the gate of Zebulon. Introducing the three gates in the west, the gate of Gad, the gate of Asher, and the gate of Naphtali. The gates of the New Jerusalem never close. There are eternal safety and peace in the New Jerusalem. There are no enemies to shut the gates against. Access to the heavenly kingdom on the new earth is free and unhindered, and the glory and honour of the nations will be brought into it. Revelation 21:26. The gates face every direction of the compass, and their perpetual openness invites everyone to partake of the goodness of God's grace. See Revelation 22:17. Welcome to the realm. When we look back into human history, it wasn't just the Chinese that carried forward the ancient messages for us to decipher. Many different cultures show us the sine wave. The Aztecs, 
Inca, Egyptian, Roman, Mayan and Aborigines all left us messages to decipher. It's the Creator's glory in many forms. The Rainbow Serpent, an Aboriginal story from Australia. Long ago in the Dreamtime, a group of Aboriginals were out hunting. After many hours they grew tired and decided to rest, and as they sat around telling stories and warming their hands by the fire, one of them looked up. There on the horizon was a beautiful multicoloured arch, a rainbow. But the Aboriginals thought that it was a serpent moving from one waterhole to another, and they were frightened as they did not want the huge brightly coloured serpent in a waterhole near their camp. But they were grateful that he did not seem to be moving too near their own waterhole. One young man wanted to know more about the rainbow serpent, so when he returned home he asked the old men of his tribe why the hunters had been scared of the rainbow serpent. The old men told him that the rainbow serpent was one of the dreamtime creatures who had shaped the earth. In the beginning the earth was flat. As the rainbow serpent wound his way across the land, the movement of his body formed the mountains and the valleys where the rivers lived. He was the biggest of the dreamtime beings and his power scared even the other dreamtime creatures. At last, tired with the effort of shaping the earth, the rainbow serpent crawled into a waterhole where he lay in the cool water which soothed him and softened the bright colours of his body. Each time the animals visited the waterhole, they were careful not to disturb the water for although they could not see him, they knew he was there. He only came out after heavy rainstorms when his waterhole was disturbed and when the sun touched his coloured body. Then he rose up from the waterhole and travelled over the treetops, up through the clouds and across the plain to another waterhole. The people were very fearful that he was angry and would churn up the land once again, so they were very quiet and still as he moved to his new home. Once he was there he disappeared beneath the water again and was not to be seen. That is why Aboriginals are careful not to disturb the rainbow serpent as they see him going across the sky from one waterhole to another. We hope you can see that every culture has left clues to how this world works. In modern times it has been stolen from you all. But we are giving it back to you and helping you to see the glory it represents. So what is our ether doing, you must be thinking? The ether, or dielectric, is basically a giant capacitor that is constantly changing polarities due to the mechanics of the angel technologies. So what our spirals are doing is rotating the positives and negatives. This is what I would call alternating current. Nikola Tesla didn't invent alternating current, he just termed it so. Our Milky Way, which I decoded as a sine wave, is actually a giant spiral in 3D that has constantly programmed the ether with positives and negatives with various colour and potential. This is alternating current. It is all around us. All of the angel's halos are also doing the exact same role, creating AC electric, which can be seen being utilised during a tornado or water spout activity. Nikola Tesla's vortex maths is directly connected to this process as it represents the alternating current and its potentials. This is where our world chakras tie in with the Milky Way. Using Tesla vortex maths and looking from the East Gates area, you can see how the vortex maths is utilised. This amazing knowledge shows us the chakras are key locations harvesting the positives and negatives of maximum potential. The alternating current from the ether at key areas within this matrix. We believe they are also synced with other waveforms that interact and change at the solstices and equinoxes, such as pushing our sun further north for the 24-hour Arctic sun cycle. 
What they are basically doing is acting like a horizontal and vertical hold, guiding our luminaries east to west and back again across the heavens, in sync with where their spirit is being projected from. The spirit world is the electrical part of the process of electromagnetism. Whatever is contained within that field has no choice but to have its spirit projected 90 degrees in opposition of the physical halo and altar. The altar is where the sun's true self is projected from, as magnetic Eve elevates the electric atom above and creates those signatures of the angels, luminaries, halos and rainbows. Our sun uses positives during the day and our moon uses negatives by night. This is why the moon self-illuminates at night and appears washed out during the day. Enoch mentions the moon gives its light to the sun. This is why. Positives during the day and negatives during the night. This also applies to the ether and waters. It's raining men or positives during the day and it is raining women on negatives during the night. It is constantly alternating and being programmed with information, colour and electrical potential 24-7. Chakras and Milky Wave Spiral are activating and deactivating switching mechanisms that are in sync with the movement of the luminaries. Day and night are controlled from within this spiral. Ancient sites are connected to these events because of what resides below there, the angel technologies. Let us now finish our decode of the Great Pyramid of Giza. Gate 5 of the World Chakras From our last video, you will remember I decoded the King's and Queen's chamber shafts to be antennas tuned to specific frequencies. These are designed to harness positives by day and negatives by night, hence one side having the King above the Queen and the other side having the Queen above the King. Using magnetic declination, these can be tuned specifically to any region. So one side of the pyramid harnesses the positives during the day and the other side harnesses the negative during the night. This means there is a definite switching of polarities which can be proven in the real world. I tested this myself using a solar panel. During the day it pumped air into a bucket of water. At night it switched and actually started cycling the water towards the air pump. To stop this you can add a blocking diode, however Shouldn't we just reverse its configuration for that use to make it a 24-7 free energy device? Start experimenting people. So on with the decode. For this part we are revisiting the Great Pyramid to complete the picture. Now if you remember the niches in the King's and Queen's Chamber, I connected those to the same process decoded in Walter Russell's motor. They are doing the same process of generating alternating current using water and pressure. To decode the pyramid we now add the missing parts. I could see from Brian Foster's video that the chambers inside had definitely been exposed to water. So what I needed was the pump system to make this work. I came across this animation made by Edward J. Kunkel that termed this ram water jet design as a pharaoh's pump. He said it was part of how they built it. That may be the case, but its correct use and primary function is the pump system needed to cause the water to rise and fall in the King's and Queen's chambers. This effect is the same as the events taking place in Walter Russell's motor. You see, the niches are actually pressure zones that will emit an electrical pressure wave. This wave is harnessable alternating current of various potentials. How it works is the narrowings in the niches are venturis that cause a back pressure which is basically a manufactured torus field of which you have seen decoded in other works of mine. So we now have the motor and process to create the alternating current. The design is slightly different to Walter's motor but still has the same principles. The heavy blocks above the king's and queen chambers are there to create the back pressure needed to make this work and will also be shaped like a Venturi. This is the same as two poles on the Walter Russell motor.
So what did they do with this alternating current, you ask? For a very big clue to that, we will visit Dendera further along the River Nile and decode this component. This bulb, as it has been turned, is actually something very unique and special. I decoded it as a mercury arc valve or rectifier. This is a type of electrical rectifier used for converting high voltage or high current alternating current, AC, into direct current, DC. And this is how you charge your batteries or run DC equipment. Thank you for that lovely animation, Sandra. Excellent work. The mercury arc rectifier is a type of cold cathode gas filled tube. But it is unusual that the cathode, instead of being solid, is made from a pool of liquid mercury and is therefore self-restoring. As a result, mercury arc valves were much more rugged and long-lasting and could carry much higher currents than most other types of gas discharge tube. Some of these mercury arc rectifiers are still in use today. You see, mercury has a very good use in converting alternating current to direct current. This was obviously used extensively in ancient times, if you remember. I mentioned they found amounts of mercury below a pyramid in Mexico. You can now see its purpose, converting alternating current to direct current. So the Dendera light bulb now helps me decode a larger piece of the puzzle. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honour to present to you the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant is a mercury arc rectifier. It tells you this in your holy books. You will see me between the wings of angels. This is God. God is light, the electrical energy that is involved in the creation of all things. This creator is teaching science and knowledge, and how we as human beings can work with God to benefit humanity. To work with God requires you to know the rules of these electrical processes. God will work with you, not for you. Walter Russell Edison's problems of sending DC current longer distance came with its problems and fires were common. Tesla's idea was to send the alternating current to your homes and have the appliances convert it to DC electric current which is for the most part still taking place today using semiconductors. So we are basically paying for the privilege of a spiral entering our homes and bringing appliances to life. Alternating current that is free and plentiful that will never exhaust itself and has always been here since this construct's creation. Take this most sacred of knowledge and share it far and wide, for it belongs to you all. Our ancients knew this and left for us all the clues which we have decoded. My next step, of course, would have been to see how it can be harvested in more modern times. But someone else already figured this part out by identifying the spires on most buildings are actually there to harvest from the ether. They are antennas. I'm not sure who came to this conclusion, but it is 100% correct and very good research. Do let me know who discovered this so I can credit you correctly in our next video. Very well done. Excellent research. The missing component from your antenna decode is the mercury arc rectifier or as replaced within modern times, a semiconductor. So the old world science and technology now meets the new world science and technology. And as you can see, they are very much the same. APM research have decoded the ancient understanding of the ether, the Milky Way, and how to harness and generate electricity, including the demonstrations and science required, and the structures used and what to look for. But what creates the winds are the same type of spiralling pressure waves in our world. You must watch our videos to understand more of the knowledge and science behind the Creator's glory. We decode Walter Russell's science and show you what it actually relates to. And for our friend Roy, Vinny St Vincent, this one's for you. You need a mercury arc rectifier or semiconductor here, and this should help your alternating current conversion. I can't seem to get in touch with you, so I hope you find this and it helps you. Go forth and free humanity with this knowledge and new understanding of our construct's workings and how to harness it. This work of ours has become very sacred to us, for it is the truth and reality we have decoded, and we will protect it from outside interference, railroading, stealing and all the rest of it. 
Our truth is free, as the Creator intended it to be. Please share or mirror this research everywhere. It is the science and path to free energy and freedom. It is being heavily suppressed. For more information and explanations, do watch our videos as they all contain a rolling research and decode of this construct and its workings. What APM Research release is for free. It is real, honest, genuine research and you will need the science of Walter Russell to understand this world and its workings of which we are decoding and presenting to you, the world audience. And now we are going to decode rainbows for you. Here's Danielle. I'm going to share a few things about rainbows, such as the way refraction causes us to perceive them, and demonstrate with a few clips of my own where I made rainbows with my garden hose. Then I'll discuss some related topics and historical and mythological information. When I recorded rainbows I made with my garden hose, if the sunlight hitting the water droplets came in from a low altitude, I could see the entire rainbow as a full circle in front of me, appearing vertically. As the sun gained in altitude, the rainbow would gradually tilt downward, its face always remaining parallel to the location of the sun. In this diagram, the sun is at 60 degrees in altitude, so the top of the rainbow would appear to be 30 degrees from the ground. There is always a straight line connecting the sun, the lens of the observer's eye or camera lens, and the center of the circle, which is called the anti-solar point. In my video clips, I added diagrams to show the observed tilt of the rainbow in relation to the degree of the sun's altitude to the horizon at the moment each clip was recorded. Although you would never see a rainbow from the side, I turned them this way to demonstrate the angle. Here I am standing outside the rainbow and it is easy to see the full circle because the sun is about 43 and a half degrees above the horizon. So the top of the rainbow has about 46 and a half degrees of tilt away from horizontal. A few minutes after I switched to a pump sprayer to see how the finer mist would appear and the angle is about the same. Here the sun is much closer to being overhead, just over 72 degrees. And you can see I'm standing well within the circle of the rainbow. I can no longer see the entire thing unless I turn around. In this clip, the sun is about 61 and a half degrees in altitude. This rainbow appears similar to the one in the last clip, however I'm standing closer to the edge. And in this clip, the sun is at a very low angle, so the rainbow is quite vertical in appearance. With the dark background, we can see a more vivid secondary bow. While making this presentation, I realized I had put to rest an assertion common with some flat earthers, which suggests that we must have a solid firmament between us and the sun to be able to see a curved rainbow. This idea seems to be supported by what is observed when white light is passed through a prism to reveal the color spectrum. With a flat-sided prism, the resulting rainbow appears straight, and typically using prisms indoors out of direct sunlight won't reveal a curved rainbow. It then might seem logical that a firmament must be the curved prism making the curved rainbow. The answer is actually very simple. A rainbow is formed in three dimensions, although we perceive it in two. This illustration by Isaac Newton is useful to visualize that because he drew the bow using dots to represent water droplets. After it rains, the air is full of water droplets over a large three-dimensional area, and each droplet potentially refracts sunlight. The colored bands apparent to our eyes are not flat circles, they actually form a cone with the circular end farthest away from you and the point at your eye. The light inside is still being sent back to your eye, it is just received as white so the rainbow looks like a hollow circle, with the area of sky visible inside the primary bow appearing brighter than the outside. According to the law of refraction, each color's frequency is refracted at its own specific angle when exiting the water droplet. All of the droplets, at about 42 degrees in any direction in your field of view from the anti-solar point, will appear red to you, and each other band of color you see is in order according to its corresponding angle of refraction. The closer a droplet is to your eye, the more narrow your field of view is at that distance, so less actual distance from the center is needed to reach the specific degree of refraction for color. This is how the cone of color is formed. 
Each droplet does refract all of the visible color spectrum, but again, the color revealed to your eye is solely dependent on its angle from your eye to the antisolar point. I was surprised to find there is still debate over the physics behind how the visible spectrum is revealed to the eye in some situations, especially in the case of the glory, which is another way the visible electromagnetic spectrum is revealed. With the glory, the effect is caused by the sunlight shining onto very fine water droplets or particulates much smaller than rain droplets, such as clouds or fog or even smoke. Just like the rainbows I demonstrated, the glory you see is only centered on your head. If you take a photo of a glory or a rainbow that you make with your hose, the rainbow in the photo is not the same one you see with your eyes. It is centered on the camera's lens. The size of the glory depends on the size of the particulates. The smaller the particulates, the larger the glory. Glories are frequently spotted from the windows of airplanes, and the person looking at it will have the section of the plane's shadow that marks their location in the plane centered on the glory. Although the glory can be different sizes, the plane's shadow will still get smaller in size as it gains in distance, as it normally would on any cloud. Glories are different from rainbows because the way they are said to appear is by diffraction, not refraction. A glory is sometimes called a Brocken glory or a Brocken specter when the observer's shadow is visually stretched and appears as a phantom with the glory around its head. These are named after Brocken, the highest mountain peak in Germany, where the specter is frequently seen because it is common to find yourself standing above fog, and when the sun is at a very low angle, you can see your shadow cast down onto the fog. If your shadow is accompanied by a glory, and it looks to your eye that the glory is on a far hill or peak, you can get an optical illusion that your shadow stretches across the entire distance. The way the colors of the rainbow are taught is attributed to Isaac Newton's experiments with light. There are varying ideas on why he chose to include indigo when describing the rainbow, considering the other colors are all primary and secondary, with the secondary ones appearing because of the overlapping areas between the primary colors. But indigo is a tertiary color, a combination of the primary color blue and the secondary color violet, and it is the only tertiary color he included. In reality, the visible spectrum includes a vast array of colors, so why didn't he include the tertiary colors between red and orange, yellow and green, and green and blue? I find it quite ironic how much art depicting Newton, even in science education graphics, does not include indigo, and marketing graphics rarely include it. Newton concluded white light must be a combination of seven colors. Suggested reasons he may have felt that way range from an esoteric need for the number seven, to his desire to reconcile the spectrum with the seven notes on the musical scale. His color wheel is also said to have been made with artists in mind for choosing complementary colors, but with the letters A through G highlighted around the perimeter, it appears the music note theory is likely a major consideration. Newton's wheel is used frequently to discuss rainbows, and it also has his seven color choices as the only colors named. I wonder why he gives equal area to all the colors except orange and indigo, which are smaller but still equal in size although logically the secondary colors would overlap much larger area between primaries than the tertiary colors would. It's possible Newton designed his color wheel in a circle based on his thought that there was a cyclical nature to the color spectrum. Previous to Newton, the rainbow was commonly described with five colors, red, yellow, green, blue, and violet. But Newton was impressed with Pythagoras' idea that there is a connection between color and music, and Pythagoras is attributed with the seven natural music notes. He felt seven was a magical number that made connections between otherwise seemingly unconnected things, like color and music, because the sum of spiritual things represented by the number three and material things represented by the number four is seven. Even today, we see the constant refusal to connect those two, especially in science and medicine. On Walter Russell's cosmic pendulum chart, he lists the seven notes on each side and also attributes them to colors with his point of inertia between Do and Re. Starting the pendulum to the left to make it follow the center spiral clockwise, the first note it would hit would be Ray, which is violet. Each side has the notes and colors in the order of violet, blue, green, yellow, and red, ending on Do with infrared. This makes much more sense, especially considering how physicist Robert Greenler was recognized with a cover story on Science Magazine in 1971 for his work with the infrared bow. He suggested there, was, there would always be an infrared stripe next to the outer stripe, because the wavelengths in infrared's angle of refraction were within the ability of water droplets to refract outward as well. 
I did find one article on Newton suggesting he used indigo because its wavelengths would also be refracted, but to me that just seems like a bit of a redundancy because all wavelengths between red and violet are already refracted. They just blur out between the primary and secondary colors. Rainbows can be found as part of many legends and myths, as well as cataclysmic prophecies being named as omens or attributes of deities. In many mythologies, the rainbow is a bridge or ladder that connects the world above with the one below, and is commonly described as only being used by deities or humans who have died in battle or have other specific traits, such as royalty or virtue. In Venezuela, the same word is used to say rainbow or wear anaconda. In New Guinea, it is a serpent that causes madness and malaria. In Aboriginal lore, the rainbow snake is the god of creation. Some myths describe the rainbow as a sort of dragon or other being that covers the sky. The Greek goddess Iris was a messenger between the gods and humans, and depicted as using the rainbow to travel between the two. She was the daughter of Thaumas and Electra, and described by Homer in multiple poems as being the goddess of light rather than the rainbow. Hindu mythology names Indra as the god of war and thunder, and he shoots his arrows of lightning using the rainbow as his bow to kill a primordial demon serpent. Even the founder and prophet of Mormonism, Joseph Smith, wrote about the rainbow. Paraphrasing his words, he said the Lord told him that in any year a rainbow is seen, the Lord is not yet returning. But when it is not seen for a year, there will be famine, pestilence, and distress among the nations, and the Messiah is not far off. According to the Gnostic Library, the cyclical history of humanity opens with the floodwaters of the book of Genesis and closes with the seals of fire and brimstone in Revelation, and that a great coming cataclysm will not evenly affect the face of the earth. Those who remain by the shelter of unaffected areas will witness a terrible duel of water and fire, and after the catastrophe, a double rainbow will announce the enchantment of a new golden age. This teaching reminds me of why I became so interested in occult symbolism. I noticed that people were looking at world symbols they didn't use in their own religion and seeing them as an indication of evil, which may be intentional as it would keep people from learning the true meaning, or religion or spiritual paths using symbols but still only looking at them in a mystic sense. I realized that not just many, but most symbols used in that way are actually more like the pictures of physical aspects someone discussing physics would use to record their observations, and likely had nothing to do with gods or beings in a religious sense. I can see the potential for the type of text I mentioned, holding occulted knowledge that would be very useful when decoded. And with that, I would like to thank you for listening. Lovely presentation, Danielle. And to complement it, we will now decode what is creating the rainbows. I can't see over the First, we will play this clip by Erin McDermott. This is the signature of one of our angels in the underworld. I want you to take notice of its rotational speed the car eventually catches up with it and overtakes it, thus giving it a rotational speed of around 40 miles per hour. They revolve in the same locations all the time. This is why I tell you to time-lapse rainbows. They permanently reside there where you see them. You just catch them at different angles and don't realize it is the same one. You know, there is an old saying, Never walk through a rainbow because it may change your sex. What an interesting statement, don't you think? Here it is. We're going to drive through it. Here it comes. Here it comes. <laughs> Wasn't that awesome, people? Now we will take a look at a full rainbow so you can see how to do it yourself. You need some altitude to capture a full one. Here's a lovely capture by into the little belts. Although you can see the full rainbow, observers on the ground only see half, and so do you. The other half is below ground, and due to the effects of electromagnetism, water droplets and even ice crystals, we get to see the full picture of something very, very special.
The time had come to start reconstructing the angels. After all the decodings and understanding of them and some deep thought, I decided to consult with a titan named Atlas, who corrected me about a great many things. After our conversation, I thanked him and I was on my way. I had learned what Atlas's burden was. First, a quick recap from Jason on what is taking place in the Taurus field we decoded in a previous video. Energy and mass are two states of the same thing. What we call atoms are equal and opposite electric charges held apart by a magnetic dipole. The energy is held in the atom has potential that we associate with mass. When the toroidal magnetic field collapses into the ecliptic, the negative charges are no longer bound and collapse into the positive charges. When the charges meet, a wave of energy is formed equal to the mass of the charges multiplied by the speed of light squared. The squaring is due to the fact that mass and energy are inverse properties of electromagnetism. Where the mass is equal in value to the inverse of the speed of light, the energy is equal to the speed of light. 1 over c times c squared equals c over 1. 1 over c and c over 1 are inverse to each other. Inside the magnetic dipole, the positive charges are held in the center diamond. The negative charges are held in orbits perpendicular to the magnetic field. When the magnetic field collapses into the ecliptic, the two opposed charges form an electric dipole, which quickly implodes on itself due to the fact that the charges are now free of their magnetic restraints. We know what happens when two opposite charges contact each other. We see it in cosmic ray showers. The two opposing charges annihilate each other and become radiation energy. Mass and energy are inverse properties of electromagnetism. Energy becomes mass again when it is subjected to a strong enough magnetic field to reform the magnetic dipole. Now we can reconstruct the angels with knowledge already gained, the Walter Russell Mortar and its science which is based on the science of the ancients. This is what I would call an angel in its most basic form. Walter was an absolute genius. Walter's science was given to him by an angel he always maintained. I bet you didn't know that, did you? From Walter's chart, this design is a fusion reactor. Notice the venturis that help compress water. This is where a manufactured torus field is created, very much the same as an antenna works. This area is where there is a back pressure and this is what generates the torus field on this motor. This one is a fission reactor. Looking at the design, it would appear daisy chaining them together would make sense. Walter terms them radar antennas. The vertical lines represent the pressure zones or venturis on the poles. Also notice water compresses to become fire and fire expands to become water. This renders the second law of thermodynamics as invalid. It is another man-made block designed to stop you progressing. Every researcher you know, including mainstream, will only talk about the effects as they do not have the answer to the cause or can never speak of the cause. Today, will you, today you will get to see the cause of a great many things. This image of Walters is also relevant to what I am about to show you. Now we will electromagnetically switch the nodes to cause them to accelerate the flow inside the halo. This of course is alternating current, which will cause the fluid in the halo to rotate around the halo as it accelerates. The nodes on the halo will get to a certain momentum speed and cause, cause the poles to flip, as Walter's image shows. As you know, magnetism and electricity are always 90 degrees in opposition. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what that actually looks like in the visible spectrum, on a creator side scale. 
you are seeing the electromagnetic projection of a positive electrical sphere, which is basically trapped within a magnetic field. This is electromagnetism. This is cubing the sphere, not squaring the circle. Remember, we are working in 3D. And you are looking at a torus field that it creates. This is effectively an electric dipole as I decoded in our Angel's Decoded video and previous videos. It is now harvesting electricity from the dielectric and the energy is being utilised at the heart of the Angel technology and put to use for whatever its intended purpose is, which relates to world mechanics, alchemy, magnetism, electricity and creation, as you see on the Walter Russell chart. The colours become inverted due to the division of the sex pairs, the positives and negatives in each band of the electromagnetic light spectrum. So you only see the colours your vision allows, but you can be sure they emanate beyond these colours and frequencies which can be seen in this chart. The dark band that you see in between these colours is called the Alexander Band. It is the actual projection of the halo itself. The angel's halo to be precise. It is now the positive of the electric dipole. The colours encircle the halo and revolve with the flow inside, which is controlled by electromagnetic switching from the various pairs of poles we call nodes. As we have mentioned before, time-lapse rainbows and you will see how they revolve. This is their arc. The orange half sphere you see below double rainbows is this electromagnetic field. This is the signature of one of our angels. The sphere of that halo is being cubed. These are all connected and working together in this matrix of angel technology. All timed and synced events working 24-7, each of which is a revolving Tower of Babel, which simply means the mixing of the positives and negatives, which is what they are designed to do. The Celtic Tree of Life represents these processes, all Tree of Life symbology represents the same processes, and our ancestors all knew this very well. This information is what your holy books and creation stories are trying to tell you. Man has corrupted it to hide and steal it. Genesis 9, 10-16 is related to this exact process as all angels operate the same way. Now you can see the duality of this technology. The effects of electromagnetism cause the halo to create a projection of itself in the heavens, which reverses its flow of direction back to the physical angel halo below. These are what create tornadoes and water spouts. They are a visible part of this process. We have something very special to show you. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honour and an absolute pleasure to present to you Adam, Eve, the apple and the snake. Adam is the smaller halo and represents the positive part of the electric dipole and Eve represents the larger magnetic part of the dipole. The apple is their combined positive and negative electromagnetic torus fields and the snake is the compression of smaller dipoles from the ether being channeled within its field which of course is what is generating electricity as it divides and multiplies in this rotating tower of Babel we call a vortex. The mixing together of many smaller electric dipoles thus creating more positives and negatives as they are compressed and make that electrical signature we call lightning, dividing and multiplying as they arc in all directions from their source of origin, the combined electromagnetic halos of Adam and Eve. Their spiralling pressure waves emanating outwards, spiralling into even more electric dipoles in our atmosphere, radiating outwards and electrically charging everything within its path the spiralling pressure waves of electromagnetism. This is the breath of angels. The word wind represents the windings as scripture mentions. Those windings in the sky, created by angel technologies that even Ezekiel tried his best to describe. 
a wheel in a wheel. The eyes are round about it, which is in relation to the nodes and their motions. The Vesica Pisces, the Scarab Beetle, Buddha, and all those other depictions of the Creator's tools. The angels are the Creator's tools of creation. This is the Genesis machine. You live on top of the Genesis machine. And this is how Adam and Eve create their Taurus fields. They create it, maintain it, and destroy it, which of course releases all those positives and negatives to create the signature of God creating lightning. Thank you, Atlas. It is a great honor to share your burden with the tribes of the world. This is your creation story, people. These are the angel technologies of a creator that has been hidden from you, so that greedy people can steal their glory from right below your feet. This knowledge and information is not copyright to any race, religion, group or nation. It is the birthright of every human being. Carrying on from Walter's motor design, I decided to attach harness points where Walter Russell's motor would attach them and it produced this. These two are one and the same, the day configuration and the night configuration of our sun. This is an angel, a very special one. This is the sweetback transformer and flyback killer Jimbo mentioned earlier. It is pushed west and then shut down or its light suppressed and returned east to start again. This is also the Egyptian 12 gate story. Now we understand Walter's motor design and its configuration, we look into what is creating the heat below our equator, and this is what we think is producing all that heat. Cody volunteered to take us for a tour to a journey to the centre of the motor, so you can see how Walter's octaves factor into this. You now know the octaves represent pressure zones or venturis that will produce alternating current. Cody will also deploy markers where these octaves are on our world map and One Conscience is going to speak about those in a few moments. Cody will play the tone at every octave Pay particular attention to the first five tones, as you will recognise them. Each tone is assigned a colour from the colour spectrum. Now remember, there is a back pressure created in the west, pretty much the same as Walter's motor design. The east side of the motor uses the right hand rule, and the west side uses the left hand rule, as they have mentioned before. These processes help to cause that collision in the colour spectrum of orange yellow and green yellow which collide with white and create a short circuit, which is basically free energy. This is what Walter was trying to explain to you. Do you recognise that people? That was a direct reference to Mount Miru the direct centre of our grid, the navel of the earth, the 0.0, .0 location on our Nazca Mandala overlay grid. This is the direct centre of Atlantis. The closest landmass we can find to here appears to be Ascension Island, very aptly named it seems. If you remember from an older video, when I panned around the Nazca Mandala in a 3D environment, it produces a 6-tier pyramid. This is the direct centre of that pyramid, so it seems our underworld is a very large pyramid that covers this entire map and beyond. I hope you can see and understand now how very special Walter's work related to the octaves and the creation processes. I'm going to hand you over to One Conscience now for some extra information on this part. So, 
I'd like to discuss some points on what we think is below the equator and it's the same principle as the Walter Russell motor. As the energy comes in from the east, it will spread out along the grid at each of the compression points. Now, although we can't be completely sure of the scale, we can be assured that this is turning on, compressing and expanding, and it will cause our, our surface to shake, hence earthquakes. This design also runs along and lines up with a great amount of our volcanoes, which we know are the cleansing process for the waste of the systems and processes that occur below. There is more to lava and the flow that I'm going to cover later in this presentation, but for now, let's get on with the design. So, as I said, this may not be 100% a to scale, but we are working with the same principles, and the points I will discuss fall into the general areas. Some of the points I could identify showing the technological signature are as follows. Point one, here we have the deepest quakes or the most powerful of the octaves ever recorded on a repeatable basis. We now know this is identified as a torus field. This probably occurs here because of the compression to start up for the pressure required to generate a manufactured torus field venturi. Point two. In this area, we have the dragon's triangle. On either side of this part of the design, we will have opposite directional flow of the oceanic tides. This creates two opposite vortices which one is positive and one is negative, and ships should be very cautious while traveling here. This is also one of the rare spots we will find blue lava, which is lava of the hottest degree holding an electrical charge. Point three. Here, we found an old map that shows an angel that is here blowing its wind, which is the energy. It flows up along the grid in a northeast direction. Point four. Here in Africa, there are many spirals carved in the ground covering an entire area. This is a sign of a very sacred site related to the workings of the realm and showing us it is a special Taurus energy point. Next, of course, we hit the 0.0, .0 point. This has been called many things such as Mount Maru and the Garden of Eden, just to name a couple but we will refer to it as the Brahma energy. Residing here are the very aptly named Ascension Islands. Point six. This is near Venezuela and also Angel Falls. Again, what a perfectly named location. This has the tallest uninterrupted waterfall at 807 meters high. Point seven. This next marker is the Galapagos Islands, which means tortoise. This is also the only place north of the equator you will find penguins living freely. These islands were forged of lava and isolated for thousands of years. The next marker is right about the international date line, so the data here isn't given to us with much disclosure or honesty. And the final horizontal marker would fall on the west gates and we have no data. This is where the sun will shut down for its return to the east 
according to the Egyptian pyramid texts. The next point, starting in the north. This point would be at the north gates, where we have no data besides what Enoch states. This is where snow, dew, and rain come from, as well as very strong winds. The next point is where the magnetic data from Ceres appears to land. The next point is Iceland. This, like the Galapagos Islands, exists because of lava. This is also the area where land will rise forth sometime after the pole shift event. The next point is where the southern anomaly resides. Here, there is an inner radiation belt which leads to a flux of energy particles. Here are two angels sharing the same axis point, causing a magnetic dipole. And the last two points head into Antarctica territory and to the south gates. Data is unavailable for either of these locations. So, as you can see, this design has some major effects that are recordable repeatable and observable to us on the surface. I hope this helped everyone to understand the effects of the principle Walter Russell used when he was given this information by an angel. Now, going back to those five tones. Do you recognize those tones, people? That was a direct reference to Mount Meru the direct center of our grid, the navel of the grid, the 0.0, .0 on our Nazca Mandalo overlay grid. This is the direct center of Atlantis. The closest landmass we can find to here appears to be Ascension Island, very aptly named it seems. When I pan around the Nazca Mandala grid in a 3D environment, it produces a six-tier pyramid which is made from six squares, six circles, and six rhombi. Can you see it? This is the direct center of that pyramid, so it seems our underworld is a very large pyramidal structure that spans this entire map and beyond, and contains the 144,000, the Creator's glory. The descriptions found in all holy books of amazing places are references to what is in the underworld and beyond those international datelines. These are descriptions of the Creator's glory and references certain locations as in the Book of Enoch and his descriptions of the gates and their angles to one another. If you remember the 2012 Olympic ceremony, the spiralling mound represents Mount Meru and the light shining from the underworld is where major parts of the Creator's glory resides. Then man comes from the underworld and starts the industrial and technological revolutions, the tree of life decoded and plundered. It has very obviously never stopped. Today they boast they can project their own sun and moon. We can find references to the underworld in every culture's beliefs. Here's Jack's dreaming. In ancient times, the concept of a hollow space within or below the surface of the earth was widespread throughout all cultures. This idea of a subterranean realm or realms became intertwined with further ideas of creation and afterlife. If we look to these myths and stories, we may find many similarities. Although there is much diversity amongst the Australian Aboriginal peoples regarding local myths, the structure of the Aboriginal universe varies little across Australia. The sky was the plain on which supernatural beings lived and our ancestors resided. It was the home of the soul. The earth was circular and flat, 
covered by the dome of the sky which stretched to the horizon. The underworld plane resembled the earth plane and was inhabited by beings, but others believed it to be an empty void. It is generally believed, though, that it is through the underworld that the sun woman and the moon man return to the eastern horizon from the west. The Mayans and the Aztecs' concept of the underworld was very similar. Known as Zibalba by the Mayans, the underworld was a vast complex of nine underground levels, entered through caves or through sacred waterholes called cenotes. The Zibalba is described in the Popol Vuh, the sacred text of the Maya, as an expansive place of rivers, mountains, houses where the dead were tested, and the council place of the lords. The Aztec underworld, Michlan, is similarly described as being a very wide place with no windows or light. The Aztecs believed that at their death, the individual had to return to the place of birth, the maternal womb. The soul, therefore, had to take the journey to Michlan and traverse nine hazards and dangers, mirroring the nine months within the womb. The ruler of this domain was Mictlan Tecutli, who resided deep below with his wife, Mictecati Kuati, living in a windowless house. APM research have concluded that there are many different technologies beneath our Earth's surface, and that often these technologies have been given the identities of living beings, such as men or gods. A husband and wife in a windowless house could well represent technology, with the male and female being the positive and negative aspects of the technological process. As Walter Russell said, there must come a time when religion and science come together. That time is now. The nine worlds are the homelands of various types found in Norse mythology. These realms are held in the branches of the world tree, Yggdrasil. Helheim is the underworld realm of the dead and resides in the roots of Yggdrasil. It is a place where those who did not find themselves in Valhalla, where the brave warriors go, were destined for eternity. Helheim literally means house of hell, and hell resides over this dominion. Norse mythology describes a complicated afterlife, one dependent on your actions while alive, and Helheim is the darkest and deepest of these realms. A story is told of how a son of Odin, Balder, made his way to Helheim to bargain for his spirit with Hel after being tricked in a game by Loki. He descends the trunk of Yggdrasil and travels for nine nights through dark valleys before meeting a giantess, a gatekeeper, who lets him pass. He then arrives at another gate guarded by a fearsome dog, Garm. He eventually reaches Hell, but to no avail, and even Odin cannot bargain for his son to be returned to Valhalla. According to the prophecy of Ragnarok, an army of the dead shall rise from Helheim on a ship made from the fingernails and toenails of the dead to fight against the Asgardian gods. The ancient Mesopotamian underworld, most often known in Sumerian as Ker, Ikala, Arali or Kigal, was said to be a dark, dreary cavern located deep below the ground, where inhabitants were said to live a shadowy version of their earth lives. Unlike many other ancient afterlives, in this Sumerian underworld there was no final judgment for the deceased and the dead were neither punished or rewarded for their deeds. The ruler of the underworld was the goddess, Ereshigal, and her husband, Nergal, the god of death, her home, the palace, Ganzir. The seven gates of the underworld are guarded by a gatekeeper named Neti, Sumerian. The dying god Dimuzid spends half of the year in the underworld, while during the other half his place is taken by his sister, the scribal goddess. Geshtinana, who records the names of the deceased. 
The entrance to the underworld is believed to be located in the Zagros Mountains in the Far East. The underworld is lower even than the Abzu, the body of fresh water that the Mesopotamians believed lay deep within the earth. The Sumerian texts describe gates to the underworld, through which one may descend to the below or ascend to the heavens. In Enki and the World Order, the weather god Iska is said to open the bolt of heaven. Thus, clouds, winds and other atmospheric phenomena enter through these gates. In other accounts, it is the sun, moon and Venus who are charged with opening this bolt of heaven. In their cosmology, the ancient Egyptians believed the earth to be flat, oval-shaped and surrounded by oceans. Beneath the earth lay the vast expanse of the underworld, the Duat, through which ran the primordial waters of Nun. The landscape of the Duat was similar to that of earth, but far more malevolent. Its ruler, the god Osiris, previously the king of the earth. There are two Egyptian texts that describe the belief systems of the Egyptians in regard to the Duat. These are named Guides to the Hereafter and consist of the Book of the Dead and the Book of the Amduat. These texts describe the nocturnal journey of the sun god Ra from his entry into the underworld with the setting of the sun until he arises the following day on the opposite horizon. This journey is the same that the deceased take after burial. The journey is divided into 12 hours, with each hour representing an obstacle that Ra has to overcome. These include searching for the tomb of Osiris, facing his enemy Apep, navigating through the difficult realm of Sokar, and fully regenerating to emerge as the rising sun. For the deceased, each hour was a portal into the next, with gates in between, each gate guarded by a demon, whose name must be correctly recited. If successful, one would then pass into the Hall of Judgment, where you would recite the Confessions of Mart, declarations of innocence from sinful deeds. You would then pass into the Hall of Mart to have your heart weighed in the weighing of the heart ceremony. Anubis takes the heart of the deceased and places it upon the golden scale balanced against the white feather of Mart, a symbol of truth and balance. The gods present within the hall would then counsel, and the sh should the deceased be justified before Osiris, he would cross the heavens to the field of reeds by boarding the ship of Ra and sailing safely through the dark underworld. Should the heart weigh heavier than the deceased would be devoured by the monster god Amut. Sheol is the Hebrew underworld. According to Job, it is a dreary, dark and disorderly land from which return is not expected. Here the dead, rich and poor, master and slave, all meet without distinction. Silence reigns supreme and the dead merely exist without knowledge or feeling. In many respects, the Sheol is rather like the Babylonian Aralu and the Greek Hades. In fact, Sheol is often referred to as Hades. The view of the Sheol is that it is somewhat like a huge grave and very much like a grave. It is protected by gates. The Old Testament describes the Sheol as the opposite of the promised land. It is the exilic wilderness and the bunker of the enemy Satan, the great dragon who was cast into this grave to eat dirt for eternity. Hidden deep beneath the earth and ruled by the god Hades and his wife Persephone, the underworld was the kingdom of the dead in Greek mythology. A sunless place where the souls of those who died went after death watered by the streams of five rivers, the Styx, the Acheron, the Coxitis, the Phlegeton and the Leaf. It is divided into at least four regions, Tartarus for the worst transgressors, 
the Elysian fields where only the most excellent dwelled, the fields of mourning for those hurt by love, and the asphodel meadows where the majority of mankind end up. According to Homer, the underworld, or Hades, as it can bear the name of its ruler, is beyond the earth-encircling river of ocean at the western end of the world, and there were entrances in the known world through which one could enter. A cavern near the ancient town of Tenerus, the bottomless lake at Lerna, and the volcanic lake Alvinus. Upon death, the soul was led by Hermes, near the entrance to the underworld, where a ferry awaited to carry it to either the Asheron or the Styx. The ferry is rowed by Charon, the infernal boatman, and only those who paid the fare with coins placed over their eyes or under their tongues when buried were granted passage. The rest remain trapped between two worlds. Following the boat ride, souls enter the gates, guarded by the multi-headed dog Cerebrus, who allows souls to enter, but never to leave. The souls are then brought in front of a panel of three judges, Radamanthus, Minos and Isus, who pass sentence based on the mortal deeds during their earthly life. Most end up in the neutral zone, the Asphodel Meadows. So we can see that stories of underground realms occupied by gods pervade mythology. These homes are not always found deep beneath the earth. They are sometimes in mountains or deep beneath the waters. Access to their domain is usually through a cave, although sometimes it may be through a waterhole or a lake. The inhabitants of these realms do not desire to be visited by unexpected or unwanted company. Yet certain individuals are granted access. These underground domains are filled with houses or vast halls, rivers of fire flow, and there are many gates often guarded by monsters or demons. Enki's home is described as built of silver and gold and lapis lazuli. The overwhelming impression is that the underworld is not a place for the living but rather a supernatural space for the dead, whereas in actuality it is the home of the workings of our realm. The rooms below, the gates, the levels, all indicate a remarkable technology personified in myths and legends as the home of the dead, inhabited by miraculous gods. The sign on the door of the underworld says very clearly, Keep out. So, let's look at the connection between lava and magnetism today and work through how the lava is helping shape the magnetic flow through the realm. So science, which let me say, I normally disagree with due to the misinformation they portray, says the Earth's magnetic field source is the molten iron and metals in the core. They also say the spinning of the Earth produces the same effect as electric current in a coil, which then produces our magnetic field. Now, if lava itself flows under the surface in different layers of our world, this lava is consistently moving and mixing with different metals and minerals of the Earth as it does so. One of the main minerals is magnetite which is now mined as iron ore. The magnetite is a mineral and one of the main iron ores with the chemical formula Fe304. It is one of the oxides of iron and it is ferromagnetic. 
It is attracted to a magnet and can be magnetized to become a permanent magnet itself. It is the most magnetic of all the naturally occurring minerals on Earth. This is carried all through the realm. As we, the APM team, have learned, the world is littered with volcanoes in a wide range of size, many very active and many lie dormant waiting. None, I believe, are extinct. Rock magnetism is the study of magnetic properties of rock, sediment, and soils. This is studied to understand the Earth's magnetic field. Now, when we add in the factor that most volcan volcanoes contain silicone, we get a different idea about the production of the magnetic flow on Earth. The layers below are magnetic circuit from the lamination of silicon steel that maximizes the flux density and minimize the eddy current. When we look at this in the terms of lava flow, we can get a good idea of what's going on here. The movement of the lava flow through the circuit of the underworld layers is actually creating the magnetic flow through the world. When we look at the ley lines, we see that they indeed fall on lines of volcanoes, even the dormant ones that lie waiting and still have pyroclastic flow in the layers below. All crustal rock contains some iron or iron compounds rendering it ferromagnetic. When individual molecules, which are magnetic dipoles, are held in alignment by being bound in a crystalline structure, the small fields reinforce each other to form the rock's residual field. Heating the material adds internal energy to it. At the curry temperature, the vibration of the molecules is sufficient to disrupt the alignment. The material loses its residual magnetism and assumes whatever magnetic field might be applied to it. As the volcanoes erupt and cool, they hold the magnetic field memory in it. Once this occurs, it is locked into place and very hard to destroy. So what lava also shows us is a record of the paleofield direction on Earth. Now we have our north-south flow of magnetic flow occurring, but there is a second flow that is a lesser flow, and it's the east to west. As the north and south flow weakens, it allows a flip to occur of the poles. When this flip occurs, it will affect all life on Earth, including our heaven rotations, our oceans, our mag magnetic driving energy force, animal and plant life, and probably our DNA, as we ourselves are crystalline structured beings that conduct Earth energies as well as all life here. You will have heard us speak of star halos previously. These six are just some of the ones that exist. Today we will concentrate on star halo Polaris. It probably has a different name but this one will do for now. I made this animation to match what our stars and star trails are doing. Polaris is node 1 on this star halo. Its opposing node is Polaris Australis in South Antarctica. All that I need to make this correct now is to find out how many star trails there are between Polaris and its southern counterpart, and each one of those is a star. We then double that number to make the correct amount of stars or nodes. Stars are actually nodes on these star halos. I give this one a rotational speed of 666 revolutions per minute, and this is the effect that it created. Each node is a positive and negative in sequence. This is why they illuminate differently. These are the sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, etc. that is seen in some holy books. It is this family connection is referencing. Now remember we don't see the halo, just the stars or nodes.
If you watch star trails in the north carefully, you will see there are small nodes and larger nodes. The smaller ones get hidden by the larger ones eventually. These are the nodes on this star halo. They are involved in the electromagnetic switching, which accelerates the liquid in the halo and causes it to flip its poles and become a very large electric dipole, the known world's largest. You should now understand what it means by precession, and our ancestors watched it closely and for a very good reason. This animation checks all of these boxes, every one of them. This is the gyroscopic nature of our world, is the field lines of these that we are seeing. There are also more star halos than these six, which we will be adding over time. I have found a way to help locate them now. In our end times 2 video, we revealed how the star halos were involved in the receding ocean events of 2017. Anywhere the intersected land, the oceans receded. Scripturally, this is by design. Changes were made to the construct to help stop flooding. These star halos are those changes and they seem to have worked. In this video, we identified one of the halos as Noah. You will also find the atomic symbol and the flower of life in these patterns. It is the gyroscopic motions of the nodes of the angels' halos that create these patterns. We find this everywhere in sacred geometry. We have always known what this represents in ancient times. It is depicted everywhere and that knowledge has been stolen from us. But we are here to give it you back. We see a lot of people getting confused with the northern and southern star trails, as they think they rotate opposite ways. Remove yourself from the box, step outside of that box and see that they are working together, as they are part of the same star halo mechanism. Here's another surprise. When I slow this star halo down, watch what happens. It is actually revolving west to east. What we are seeing is an effect called the wagon wheel effect, which explains why they give us lovely amazing displays and that shimmer in effect. This also makes the Hoppy prophecy true, as they say the stars will reverse their direction. This is good solid information from our Hoppy brothers and sisters whom freely share their ancestors' knowledge. APM Research would like to thank you for this knowledge and we hope this information helps you remember what it all means. This belongs to you all. This brings us to the Reset. The Reset event is one or more of these very large torus fields collapsing and showering our world with masses of electrical discharge as the field collapses. Remember, they create, maintain and destroy their fields, which is a repeating cycle. Locally, we see them from our smaller angels' halos and we call them lightning storms. The fields around our star halos completely engulf most areas of the map. The biblical destruction we see in history is this event and our generations will witness it. Mainstream will try to tell you it is an alien invasion or some other nonsense, as you will see nodes collapsing into the ground and seas, and even starting electrical fires on a scale we have not seen before. On this scale, the whole world is going to be affected. 
famines, communications, the electrical grid, everything will be affected and more than likely destroyed by this event. The seas and oceans will have no choice but to react to these collapsing electromagnetic fields and tsunamis and tidal waves will be common. Famines will be a very big problem and mainstream are currently trying to make that worse. We need our farming, fishing and food a maximum production right now so we can prepare for hard times ahead, including a mini ice age. The data we've seen in our end times decoded videos gives us an insight of what to expect. The lights in the sky they call Starlink are one of these collapsing fields. A change has happened and we are now seeing parts of the construct revealing itself as it goes into these changes. The previous reset was in the 1600s and in the 1800s there were more destructive events. The 1800 events were more than likely one of these fields rebuilding itself or another mechanism involved. This is the nature of the angels. They create, maintain and destroy. And now you know it relates to building and destroying their electromagnetic field, which is part of how they are involved in creation processes. These are the creator's glory and this is how they operate. The eyes around about it, as described by Ezekiel, are our stars or nodes on these star halos. We modeled this from a level Earth perspective, showing different comet trajectories. These comets are prominent nodes from various star halos. Their paths show us roughly which star halo is creating them depending on when they were first noticed. This animation helps us reveal the field. This is also why meteor showers are timed events as well, because they are timed with the motion of the star halos. What we consider the showers to be are elements being converted to matter by this electromagnetic technology. This is the alchemy of the technology, the positives and negatives of the creation, and it follows the rule of eight, just as semantics. It is the universal law in this construct. Let's talk about bow shocks from an APM perspective. A bow shock occurs when the magnetosphere which is the area surrounding our luminaries in which the magnetic field is the predominant effective magnetic field. So when this magnetosphere of a celestial object interacts with nearby flowing opposing forces in its path, such as the solar wind, it is the boundary at which the speed of the stellar wind abruptly drops as a result of its approach to the magnetopause. A common complication in astrophysics is the presence of a magnetic field. For instance, the charged particles making up the solar wind follow spiral paths along magnetic field lines. The velocity of each particle as it gyrates around a field line can be treated similarly to a thermal velocity in an ordinary gas. And in an ordinary gas, that means thermal velocity is roughly the speed of sound. At the bow shock, the bulk forward velocity of the push, which is the component of the velocity parallel to the field lines about which the particles are gyrating, drops below the speed at which the particles are gyrating. The sun is radiating spiraling charged particles from the torus field it creates. We see this in the Parker spiral. This is a localized event. 
Science calls this the solar wind, which is the spiraling magnetic field. We at APM know this magnetic field to originate from angel technology, the sun's halo, and modern terminology is a particle accelerator. Bow shocks form at comets as a result of the interaction between the opposing forces and the cometary trajectory of travel. As one approaches the sun, the opposing electromagnetic forces of the sun reveals gas being released from the cometary nucleus, revealing an atmosphere called a coma. The coma is partially ionized by sunlight, and when the opposing forces pass through this ion coma, the bow shock appears. This is not unique to the sun, as every luminary will have this pressure wave, and it's only revealed when a force is opposing it. From an APM perspective, you must always assume that a comet has a tail. The only reason you don't see it at times is because of distance, perspective, or lack of opposing forces. The first observations of the bow shock were made in the 1980s by comets Gaia Caboni, Halley's Comet, and Grigg Comet. It was then found that bow shocks at comets are wider and more gradual. These observations were all made near the perihelion when the bow shocks became visible due to the opposing force. The perihelion is when the comet comes to the closest point to the sun that it's going to get. As you know from APM perspective, all luminaries produce their own electromagnetic fields as they are the same technologies. The only difference would be their frequencies, their perspective layers, and the products that their layers allow them to interact with. Using this information laid out, I hope you have an understanding of what's going on with bow shocks and see the given information as more substance that our realm is a technological creating realm. We are truly seeing Creator's glory in all of this realm. Glory meaning magnificence and great beauty with great pride. I mentioned near the start about a time for reflection. If I could give you any advice it would be this. Do not gaze into the vortex too long as it will consume you, as it has done to these people involved in hiding and stealing this. However, even for them it is not too late. Everything within this construct is recorded, even Walter Russell tried to warn you about this. Man has to know when to stop, and these people have crossed the line. They have opened Pandora's box and are now hell-bent on hiding what they are involved in, hence your world falling apart right now. Anyone going down this path becomes the enemy of humanity, as they try always to hide the Creator, their glory, and all that they have done in their attempts to steal it. I have felt their burden, and oh, what a burden to bear. To be born into a false lifestyle and having to lie to the world. Is this the future you really want? You are making the same mistakes your ancestors made. And in history you will find people like us. Giving you warnings. You see, when you understand how all this works, 
you become something of a time lord. You see the past, the present and the future. And we are at a point in time where we still have a choice. Do you want the new world order? Or the true world order? Consider this a shot across the bows. A warning your current path is going to end in the damage or destruction of the Creator's glory. Those very things that create what we call nature. Here's one conscience with the safe zones map the CIA created. We don't know if it is 100% correct, but it does beg the question, why did they make one? Let's talk a little bit about this map. This map was put out there by Ed Daves. He's an ex-CIA agent. And this is the map of what's going to occur with our world after a pole shift. So the first area we're going to look at is the red zones. These are our safe zones, which as we can see, we have some in the United States, South America, Greenland, and part of Europe, and a little bit in Australia and New Zealand. Next, we'll look at the dark blue. This is where the coastal subsidence will occur. This will be in Northeast Russia and the southern tip of South America. Next, let's look at the green. This is where land mass is submerged. This appears to be part of Ireland, Western Australia, Southern part of America, along with the Eastern side of Mexico, and the Eastern coast of America and Canada. Next, let's look at where our hot and cold areas will mix. This will run through the United States, Southern South America, and we'll have an area that runs up from Africa up through the middle of Europe, and we'll also have a little bit over in Australia. Next, we'll look at our flood prone areas. That looks to be a lot of Northeastern Europe, most of the UK, Northeastern Africa, and Northwestern Canada, as well as the broken up islands in Can above Canada. Next, we have our lo loss of agriculture, which includes wheat, barley, rye, corn, sago, millet, rice, potatoes, apples, citrus, and grapes. These areas are going to include part of Europe, East and West, India, part of Australia, Canada, and a great deal of the United States, as well as South America. Next, we have more loss. This will consist of our livestock, horticulture, and agriculture. These items will include beef, dairy, pigs, sheep, coconut, cotton, hemp oils, peanuts, and sugars. Next, we will have new faults developing. What I noticed about these is they're running more of a north to west, uh, south than an east to west. Next, let's look at the epicenters of new major volcanic and seismic activity. So we have up in northern North America, We also have Southern America, Mexico, Eastern South America, Southeastern South America. We're also going to have new activity in Iceland. We have activity in Europe and Asia. 
all across. We also have an, a major new epicenter for great activity, which sits right about where the area that I think there's one very large volcano that runs about 1,600 miles across and 1,600 miles north and south. So, an effect of all of this is going to be that new land is going to rise. We're going to have land that rises just west of America, quite a bit west of South America, somewhere near Easter Island or Polynesia. We're also going to have land that emerges southeast of Greenland as well as the northwest of Europe. So, I hope that this information gives us somewhat of an idea of where is safe and where is not, and what we need to do to survive. This is where we are with our research. Who do we report this to? Who do we speak to that can start an investigation into these findings? Our military and police are under the control of the very people involved in hiding and stealing the Creator's glory. If they told you this, would you still work for them? As you can see people, we have some very serious times ahead and it is going to take a combined effort to get through this. Good luck people, and share this everywhere. The future depends on it. This is an APM Research Decode. Find the 
true